people occasionally express puzzlement at there being such a thing as philosophy of mathematics. Such puzzlement arises from a failure to understand that philosophy, like history, is characterized not by its subject matter, but by its style of thought, by the kind of questions it asks and the way in which it goes about trying to answer them. When this is understood, phrases beginning the philosophy of will cause no more surprise than ones beginning the history of. Philosophers attempt to answer questions we are prompted to ask by a quite special kind of puzzlement. This puzzlement arises from our imperfect mastery of the concepts we employ. These questions occur to everyone, but people are often content to brush them aside with answers that will not withstand scrutiny, scrutiny not accorded them by those lacking in philosophical curiosity. A philosopher is afflicted by an urge to subject any proposed answer to just such scrutiny and to arrive at an answer that will stand up to scrutiny. Because until he does, he is conscious that he does not understand and what he wants above all is not so much to know as to understand. The characteristic philosophical question is why can we not affect the past although we can affect the future? Someone without philosophical curiosity may answer impatiently because the past has already happened or because a previous event has either occurred or not occurred and will experience only irritation when it's pointed out that the first answer merely repeats the problem without solving it and the second may be countered by observing that a subsequent event either will or will not occur. The philosopher is irked by the inadequacies, the inadequacy of these answers that first come to mind. He's driven to seek one that will satisfy him. Well, why? Because when we are faced with this question, a question that asks why we cannot do something that seems on the face of it nonsensical and find that we cannot clearly explain what makes it nonsensical, we become aware that we do not really know what past and future are. We have no firm grasp upon the concepts of past and future. Now, these are concepts we constantly employ in the current of everyday life and everyday conversation. We recall what happened a week ago or ten years ago. We avow what we intend to do tomorrow or speculate on what will happen six months from now. We use these concepts all the time. Of course we understand them. And yet, by our inability to answer the question why we cannot affect the past, we show that we have only a superficial grasp of them. We are like soldiers in a battle who know enough to be able to do what they are meant to do but have no conception of what is happening on a larger scale. We can operate with our concepts in the situations in which we find ourselves in everyday life, in the laboratory, on the stock exchange, in the operating theatre, but in Wittgenstein's phrase, we do not command a clear view of them or attain a general understanding of them but can grasp only how they function in particular familiar contexts. This does not hold good only of the concepts we all employ in the life of every day. It applies equally in highly technical regions. Quantum mechanics supplies a familiar example. It's commonplace to remark that it's a highly successful theory. Physicists know how to use it to predict observations and measurements. And yet, frequent conferences are held to discuss its interpretation. It's well understood how the theory is to be used. It's not understood what it means, that is, what it tells us about the character of reality. Mathematics generates a number of questions causing just this kind of puzzlement and has fascinated and perplexed philosophers from Plato onwards, for two reasons in particular. First, it's difficult to say what its subject matter is, what it's about. It's reasonably clear what physics or geology or biology investigates, but what exactly is it that mathematics investigates? A standard answer corresponding to the old-fashioned division of mathematics into arithmetic and geometry used to be that it investigated quantity and space. But this unhelpful answer will no longer suffice since there's so much mathematics 
that will not fit comfortably under either head. The problem is aggravated by the second puzzling feature of mathematics, the manner in which the mathematician sets about attempting to solve his problems. He uses no telescope or microscope. He does not observe anything at all. Rather, he reasons. He carries out complex deductive inferences. The first question must be answered in a way that accords with this. Whatever it is that mathematics is about must be something that can be found out just by reasoning. Philosophy resembles mathematics in this respect. The philosopher makes no observations and requires no instruments. Insofar as these disciplines can be said to involve the making of experiments, these are thought experiments. To imagine the experiment made is quite as good as actually to make it. The two subjects thus appear to be a priori. Their results do not require us to observe how the world happens to be, but can be arrived at by thought alone. They are thus independent of how the world happens to be, but would hold good, whatever it was like. They are therefore not merely true, but necessarily true. And yet, philosophy and mathematics differ in all other respects. It's a puzzle how there can be even one subject that can be investigated a priori. That there should be two, so different from one another, appears baffling. Necessary truth and a priori knowledge are topics that engage the attention of all philosophers. It seems straightforward to understand how there can be contingent truths, things that are so but might have been different. We can get to know contingent truths only through our experience of the world by observing that they're so or deducing from what we observe that they must be so. But how does it come about that there should also be necessary truths truths that we can know, independently of our experience of the world. How is it that if we knew all contingent truths, there would be some truths left over? This is easy enough to understand concerning trivial necessary truths, such as that there are seven days in a week, or that every widow was once married. To recognize statements of this sort as true, we need know nothing other than the meanings of the words. More. We couldn't claim to know the meanings of the words if we failed to perceive that the statements are true. But mathematical theorems are seldom trivial in this sense. We may not need to start with any initial knowledge other than the meanings of the words if we are to come to recognize them as true, but the converse certainly doesn't appear to hold. We may surely know the meanings of the words without realizing that the theorems hold good. Mathematics presents itself as by far the most capacious repository of non-trivial necessary truths, and the knowledge of it as by far the most extensive body of a priori knowledge. And this fact alone suffices to make it of intense interest to philosophers. Admittedly, certain philosophers, of whom John Stuart Mill is the best-known example, have challenged the a priori character of mathematics claiming that mathematical theories rest upon certain highly general contingent facts recognizable by gross observation. But this challenge does not alter the situation greatly, for the most that such empiricists can argue is that the starting point of this or that mathematical theory, the axioms of the theory, is a collection of readily observable contingent facts. They <coughs> cannot explain why mathematicians fail to set about gathering by devising experiments, by closer observation or improved observational techniques, other facts of the same kind as other scientists do. Why instead they content themselves with the meager supply of contingent facts with which allegedly they begin and proceed to draw out their consequences by means of ever-lengthening chains of deductive argument. Mathematics is still a science quite unlike any other. The only upshot of the empiricist's contention is what is sometimes called if-thenism, which restricts the necessary truths discovered by mathematicians to those expressed by statements of the form, if the axioms of the theory hold good, then such and such a theorem holds also. And this leaves the problem of necessary truth untouched. 
that there should be such an a priori subject as philosophy is comparatively intelligible because the philosopher's task consists principally of disentangling our concepts. It does not aim so much at arriving at new truths as at coming to understand better those at which we've already arrived. Disentanglement sometimes plays a critical role in mathematics, as indeed it does in every subject. To attain the right definition of continuous or of dimension was a step of the highest importance. Nevertheless, hitting on the correct definition of a concept, though often an essential contribution to progress, remains a preliminary to the discovery of mathematical truths, not a means of discovering them. It is not the characteristic activity of the mathematician. To explain the existence of mathematics is a greater challenge to the philosopher than to explain that of philosophy itself. The capacity for wonder is a prerequisite for the activity of philosophizing, and anyone who retains this capacity must marvel at the vastness of the body of a priori knowledge amassed by mathematicians by pure deductive reasoning. 